welcome back rebels Ad, are you following me on Clubhouse at Davis BGK? Yes, I am following you, David, because you invited me to it. Oh, yeah. Uh, but if you want to follow me on Clubhouse, you can follow me at Adam Brazier. I already do, mate. <laughs> yeah, I've been loving Clubhouse at the moment. I think one thing actually I think is really interesting to talk about is the fact that when, we've, when I've been on there previously, every room I've been into has been like a creative room of just kind of people following creative d- endeavors and kind of asking for different bits of creative advice. Um, kind of fallen into some like random entrepreneur groups that are just like Americans shouting at you being like do this do that awful just make sure you follow energy. all the moderators yeah. yeah I hate it but I think that's like with any any kind of platform as soon as you go into it you're going to have the good sides of it and there's going to be the bad sides but it just takes a little while to find your tribe so I was in a room um last night actually um I just went on kind of like do my normal creative one but I started following a few photographers on there and uh, I think it's someone who I'd met in a different room uh, was in this other room so i went in there i was like, oh this is quite cool everyone's a photographer and um, we we're having like a chat but it was just a really weird space to be in because it wasn't what i was used to like i'm normally being in a room that's kind of just creatives talking about creative business whereas this was more like professional photographers who some of them were really really good as well like i've been in the industry for years and years as uh, like kind of 50 years old plus like literally professionals like they were so good uh, and one thing they put out actually was does anyone want to crit? And a few different people kind of said like, yeah, go on, like criticize my work. Uh, and I was like, ah, oh, actually, I'm just going to throw my hat in and just like see what they say. No way. Which is quite nerve wracking because I was like, I don't want them to just like completely tear me apart. Because obviously no Did one they? wants to get destroyed. It was quite brutal, but in like a constructive way. Uh, and they were like, they kept kind of being like, we're not, we're not being mean here. We're just kind of trying to give yeah. you like constructive <laughs> advice. Because I think, it was a room where they wanted to help people kind of head towards different directions. Um, but I think it, it was really interesting because I think it really made me realize that there's kind of two forms of audiences. You've got kind of like your peers and then you've got your like followers or fans. Because if I put something up on Instagram, like the response I get from there is just like so like unanimously, this is amazing, this is great. That I think you get so used to hearing that, that when you go into a room that's not your audience it can be like yeah those people just maybe don't like the stuff or they like certain elements of it but like oh i don't like how you edited this or i don't like this um and i just found it a really interesting experience because i kind of came away from it being like kind of like not upset but like you've kind of taken a hit which you're not used to and i think that's great for people to do just to kind of build their like build their self because i think it's important to be able to take criticism and making sure you're putting yourself in situations where you are actually taking criticism because it can be very easy to just live in this world of just like yes men i suppose and yeah. people who like what you do and continue to kind of like hype you up for it yeah w- were there any lessons that you took away from it are you going to change any tactics when it comes to your photography now that as a direct result of of going through that crit or or is it the stage of like I know what my audience responds to. I'm confident in what I do. So I'm actually going to disregard that information. There was kind of two sides to it because I think I know my audience really well and I know what they like. And I think that's probably where me and some of the people in there differed because it's like they're maybe a bit older or a bit more established in the traditional editorial photography scene. Whereas my audience are generally kind of younger and the things that they like are different to what older people like. And I think... This has kind of made me think a lot about kind of how important things like TikTok and things are, because it's like you can either just kind of hit your audience and grow up with your audience, or you can constantly be looking at new things and seeing what's on trend and trying to like never kind of becoming that person who's like that kind of grumpy old man who's like, oh, the youth are idiots. They don't know anything. Mm. Because I think there's so much you can learn from new generations and take inspiration from there that you can definitely kind of bring into your work. But I think like there were things that I took away from it in terms of them being like, well, if someone that if someone came to hire you, they'd brief flick through your feed. These ones from this point downwards maybe don't represent what your style is anymore. So you could maybe like get rid of those. And that kind of made me think about just kind of actually consolidating down my work a bit and kind of being like, well, actually if I treat this like a portfolio, kind of after a certain point, then I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, it kind of makes sense. I would go through and so I kind of ask myself the question, would I post this picture now? And then I kind of think, well, maybe I should remove that one. Maybe I should remove this one because it doesn't really reflect what I'm putting out at the moment. Uh, so I think that really made me think because 
I'm very much on the mindset of you should produce as much content as possible and keep putting out because that firstly helps you grow on social media, but also helps you grow as a creative. Because mm -hmm. if you keep putting out the work, it's going to force you to develop and get better quickly. And it's going to make you go and make the work, which I think can be really powerful. Uh, but then I think after a certain amount of time, once that benefit of kind of like the newness is gone, it is worth going back through your work and looking back and working out well, what do I actually want to represent me like remaining on my feed? Yeah, and, and I suppose it is nice to have other people, ha have a fresh set of eyes cast over your work because, and we touch on this in, in this week's episode actually coming up, of of that feedback loop from your fans who are expecting a certain thing and don't really want you to deviate from it. So there they're, there's really can't be much change in growth within that. I, I certainly think it's such a fine line, isn't it? I think... I think the correct answer for everything is like yes and it's no and it's it's whatever you want <laughs> yeah. it to be. I think th this is the funny thing. It's like with with this podcast there's no there's no one way that we've said to do things. There's a million different ways that work. There's there's no wrong decision. You can you can go and do something and you can completely fail at it and or you can completely succeed at it. The person who's in control is you. And so I think that's why podcasts are great because listening to the stories of other people, you can see what's worked for them and then you can go, well, how, how can that, how can I make that work for me? And then you're going to do it in your own, in your own unique way. And I suppose everything just comes down to self-awareness of take on board as much criticism as you can, as much criticism as, as you can handle. Because like, like you said, you felt a little bit beaten down coming out of it. Um, Certainly, there's someone who, for some reason, keeps leaving the same comments on my on my paintings that my um, the neon bars that I do on the side of my work aren't neat enough. So thanks, mate. <laughs> um, and I I, I messaged uh, like I wrote replied to one of his comments the other day. Like I don't know what you want me to do. Like I'm doing the best that I can. They are as neat as I can make them without using tape, and I don't want, don't want to use tape. Anyway, um, so you, you've got to take on as much criticism as you can, see if see if it's valid, because to become self-aware, you have to be aware of what's what else is going on around you and, and the opinions of, of everyone else. So actively seek out advice, actively seek out criticism, and then either do it all or don't do any of it. It's all self-awareness and it's all what will work for you. It's finding out that it's like a it's like a shopping list. It's just finding the ingredients that are going to make your perfect cake because your cake is going to be different to everyone else's. Everyone's on a different route to get to a different place. Everyone's got different tastes. They want to head in different directions with stuff. So like, for example, on the, the crit thing that I had yesterday, it was like those people work in a certain industry and they had, they're taking that they've always been taking their work towards something they've been aiming for. That's not what I'm aiming for. So it's important to take the advice, but then work out whether it actually fits for you. And take and like kind of actually think about it as well. Because I think it's quite easy to just to dismiss it and be like, oh no, they know nothing. But then think, well, they're obviously said it for a reason. They're trying to support you, trying to help you. Well, so how I, can I, you take I think take take only the advice of, of the people that have done the thing that you want to do. Because if you ha if you don't have a track record, it's why we couldn't have done this podcast ten years ago. We had to do it. It came at the time that it was ready to come because we, you can't tell people like this is how you're going to be successful in your career if we hadn't built successful careers. So I, I think uh, advice is it feels lovely to give advice to people, and so, so but if if that person hasn't done that thing, they, they it's a guess. It's like I can tell you each yeah. week what I've done. And then as a case study in March of last year, during lockdown, I applied everything to my own personal account and built a, a completely like tangible new side hustle. There's proof like you've done it. I've done it. We've done it together. We've done it within business. Only listen to the people who have done the things that you want to do because otherwise, yeah. it's, otherwise they're just guessing. That just reminds me of so many people that I feel like pop up on YouTube and little videos that I come across and where people are telling you what to do. They're trying to give you life advice. They're trying to give you business advice. And they're actually only 17 have never run a business before. And it's like, they've kind of listened to a few things from somewhere and think, oh, well, that sounds like it might work. That sounds like it might work. But I think it's not until you're getting advice from someone who's actually been there and done that, that you should actually, yeah, actually take note of it. And coming back to kind of this thing as well, I think that it really reminds me of something that Seth Godin was talking about, how it's kind of, you need to be the be you don't need to be the best person to everyone. You just need to be the best person to a small number of people. And I think 
if you can know like know who your audience is and know who those few people are that's where you're really going to see success as soon as you're aiming at just those small number of people rather than just trying to please everyone when you said that i replayed it in my head in seth's voice <laughs> yeah i literally have him. i just have him like every now and then if i need him i just go back and, and pull out seth and he says something wise to me and i feel like seth would would pop out of my brain and say you're like that's that's what it's all about is the search for that that audience i mean audience is, is a dirty word that's been corrupted but tribe or or just the the people that appreciate what you do the people that are coming on that journey with you because that's that's what this is your creative career is uh, is a journey it's not for everyone like not everyone's going to come on that ride with you it's only you don't want everyone you only want the people that are super fully aligned with what you're trying to do so find those people grab hold of them and keep them keep them around you at all times oh 100 percent. like the fact when you said journey then it just gave me a little vision in my mind of like imagine you're going on some fucking epic journey like you're walking across the desert don't or something. stop believing that's what it made me think of. <laughs> but like if you're going on that route like you might find people along the way who are going to come and join you and it's like you want people who you like around you you want an audience that's supportive that are going to be there for you as you're doing it because if you fill it with just like random annoying people you've got a hell of a long way to go with all these annoying people around you so try and build a nice audience of good people around you for that journey and because that will make the ride so much more enjoyable yeah uh god we've been all over the map uh, we we started off with uh getting criticism and getting feedback to to finding your people and, and going on the journey but and so speaking of finding your people we found our people and they come to access every month and our next event is on the 2nd of march yeah, so that's Access, which is our live monthly events, which we do a small talk followed by Q&A um, over Zoom. So yeah, so if you go to creativerebels.co forward slash access, you can sign up for that. Uh, we'll send you a link just before and it'll be really fun. So come along. Yep, this is a free event. It's next week and it's always really, really valuable. Like we've had loads of good feedback on it. Um, it's great for us to, to talk to you. You can ask your direct questions if you've got anything burning that you're, you'd like to discuss, then uh, bring it along and we will break it down for you. Cool. So let's get into this week's episode. Well, let's. Uh, Martina Martian, what an absolute legend. Um, I discovered her on TikTok and I think she's such an amazing case study of something that we talk about a lot, which is getting good at one thing first, no matter how many varied passions that you have that you would like to because people can be totally crippled by choice and there's a thousand doors but they won't walk through one so they end up walking through none and and um what martina has done is she's currently and it's really interesting to watch she's currently transitioning from one career to another yeah she's gone from an illustrator to a photographer but she's always she's been doing photography for the last 10 years you just haven't seen it it's been something she's been working on the sideline but she hasn't kind of had this battle between illustration and photography on her kind of creative outlet that the world's seeing. And it's only now that she's had this huge level of success within the illustration world that she's now transitioning it into photography. And it's really great to watch how exactly she's doing that because it's not just a hard cut. It's this slow little tease kind of making her way over into the photography world. And her photography is great as well. Like she's really smashing that as well as the illustration yeah i i messaged her the other day she's just done a shoot with uh, jay gray who is an amazing musician whose music i really love so um yeah she's she's meeting all the right people she's taking cool ass photos so she is she's really doing it and i i think that we obviously talk about do one thing well become established at that and then you could use your success as that one thing to then go into something completely unrelated because you have a track record and I think people trust you because you have a track record. Mentioned it earlier in this intro. We couldn't have had a podcast without having a track record of running creative businesses. As soon as you have had that first success, and I know a lot of you guys listening have not had your first success yet, you're still building that that first thing up. Once you have it, you can literally go any direction, but your social proof is, I made, I made this thing work before. It doesn't matter what the industry, it doesn't matter what it is. If you've done something well before, then this, this trust transfer happens over into the new thing where people say, okay, they're serious because they've done this. So they can obviously do something. They're, they're, they can make something happen. So it's easier for them to have the belief in you, isn't it? Because it's like they, 
if it's someone who's just starting something, they're going to say, oh, I'm starting this thing. And we'll probably just think, oh, it probably won't happen because most people don't come through with their word. And especially if you've done like 10 different ones. So it's like as soon as you've done one thing and you've, got, you've proved that you can make that a success, then it's like, oh, of course, this next thing is going to be a success as well because they've shown that they can actually put in the hard work to make that a success. So I think, yeah, you instantly believe people for the second one and the third one or whatever other things they try. Cool. So let's get into this week's episode. Hi, Martina. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the show. How's it going? Uh, not bad. Yeah. I mean, it's lockdown, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about jolly things. Um, <laughs> Change of topic. <laughs> Change of topic. But I mean, we've done 2020 to death. Like, let's, let's sack that off and talk about fun things. Did you always want to be an artist all your whole life? Uh, yeah, I think I did. Whether I was brave enough to admit that is a different story. But yeah, I think growing up, I was always a creative kid and... My family always really encouraged creativity and really valued it. So becoming an artist just seemed like the best thing. And what point do you reckon you turn from kind of saying like, actually, I do want to be an artist rather than having that kind of little, oh, I'm not sure if that's right. Surprisingly, not that long ago. Um, it was probably a year or two into university and I was like studying design, um, but still not able to see like being an artist as a full time job. Um, but then all these like commissions started rolling in. I was just illustrating for fun, like outside of university. And then like, yeah, the freelance thing just became so full time that finally, quite late, I realized like, wow, this could be my real job. How was what was the talk like from uni? Were they was it encouraging with were, were people kind of saying, oh, there's this thing called freelance? Or was it very much like you need to get a nine to five and finish the course and graduate and do all the normal things? It was very much the latter. Like I was very convinced that I would just get like a graphic design job at an agency or like in-house. I just, I thought that was the path. Um, freelance was not talked about, honestly. Running your own business was not talked about. Is it true that you dropped out of uni? Yes, I did. Um, my parents hate that, but yeah. Um, I did a four year degree and then the last year I just decided, um, not to finish. It was more because like my freelance side of things was becoming so full on that it was, it was taking priority over my uni work. And at the end of my third year, I just sort of realized like it's kind of now or never you have to like go all in with this freelance stuff or stay another year at university in Sydney, which was a big thing for me. Um, staying at uni meant staying in my hometown and I really didn't want to do that. And I just felt really restless. So I just, I left and then I started traveling and freelancing and yeah, here I am. And what did that battle look like with kind of deciding to drop out? Because obviously like, that's going to be a huge thing. And I imagine just even that conversation with your parents just being like, by the way, guys, this is going to happen. Like what, what gave you the confidence to kind of actually make that leap? And like, how did that look? I mean, I think I've always been a pretty stubborn and like headstrong child. So they were never going to argue with me about my decision. <laughs> so when I said to my parents, like, listen, I'm getting, you know, opportunities with, um, at that point I was already working with Snapchat, which was like a massive thing at the time. And I was, I had big enough brands that I was working with that my parents could even be like, okay, this is a thing. Um, and I just yeah, I just said, like, I need to get out of Sydney. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be stuck. And I really do feel that, like, in Australia at the moment, there's, like, this ceiling that you kind of hit as a creative. And unless you establish yourself overseas, you kind of never leave. And I just, right. I just felt that. I felt, like, really restless and really, like, I needed to leave and, like, start working with brands outside of Australia. And... Yeah, I just trusted that gut instinct and I got out. I'm just trying to imagine what it'd be like to be your tutor and you're coming and going, oh, I'm working for Snapchat at the moment. That must be really <laughs> weird. It was weird. It was, if I had this weird like year, like that last year at university, like I was working with, I'd done stuff with Nike, I'd done stuff with Snapchat. Like I created like the official stickers for Australian Snapchat and like these massive jobs. And then I'd have to like, make time to do my uni project and it just felt so like wrong and I'd come into school and just be like I'm studying a degree for the jobs that I'm already getting so yeah. why am I still here <laughs> like especially for design like I don't think you need a degree for that 
like it's just it's a good stepping stone it taught me a lot but I didn't need it necessarily so I feel like we quite often hear about people who leave university especially in a creative field and we're like actually like well I don't feel really like I really needed to do that but I've actually heard you talk about how there were some real good positives to uni and how like you actually got a lot from it yeah def- I think what I got from university isn't the things you expect like I think people go into design school thinking I'm going to learn photoshop I'm going to learn all these practical skills but the reality is you usually teach yourself that stuff if you want to learn it um but what I did learn was how to meet a deadline how to work with people I did not want to work with how to do creative briefs that I really didn't want to do like you get given these projects that you would never choose to do yourself and I think that's actually a really good thing when you're first starting out because you're forced to explore things you may have not explored. How do you deal with a creative brief now that you don't want to do? I usually say no. <laughs> Wicked. That was, why, that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> but yeah, back then I think it was probably good that I was forced to do some stuff I didn't want to do. Yeah, I I think when you're starting out, like you don't you don't always know that it's going to be a bad project, even though in the beginning you get kind of get those vibes. And what we have found is over the years, whenever we've had the vibes in the beginning from that first like meeting where you're sort of like, mm, I'm not sure this is the right fit. They always turn out to be like a nightmare client or a nightmare brief or whatever it is. And it's true. I think you have to trust those gut instincts. And like the more you move along and get to know yourself as a creative and get to know what works and what doesn't work, the better those instincts get. But um, that being said, I think it's also good to kind of I think listen to that gut instinct and think about whether it's fear or whether it's like a real feeling because sometimes you just say no to stuff because you're like I don't think I can do it or I haven't done anything like that before but so if someone does come to you and they kind of say like can you do this and you feel like I'm not actually sure whether I can do this or not because I've not done it before what route would you go to learn how to do that kind of thing I think my thing now is like don't say no straight away um, but ask more questions Mm-hmm. And like, probably you will end up saying no anyway, but just ask a bit more and then you never know. Um, it could be completely different to what it sounded like in the beginning or there could yeah. be so much more flexibility. But yeah, just ask more questions. And... and is there any kind of questions that you would ask, like always when it comes to a brief coming in? I do find myself often asking, like, have you looked at my other work? Um, are you after my creative style? Like, I think that's a important question because sometimes they just want to work with you and your style and they don't really mind what you end up making but sometimes they actually do have a really final thing and they're just kind of bringing you on to make their vision come to life so it's like okay whose vision are we working with like do you want my vision or is yours (laughs) yeah I think as an artist there's definitely like that's a real hard balance because it's like are they coming to you because you're an artist are they coming to you because you have the skills to make it happen and I feel like you definitely need to be careful of going down just the skills route because then it's like you're just churning stuff out that isn't you and it's you're just doing things for other people whereas as soon as they're coming to you for just the artistic point of view then it's like you're going to have so much more control in that situation and maybe that's quite a good way to balance and determine is this a brief I'm going to take or not it's like what do they want me for the my art kind of the artist side of me or just the the laborer do they just want me because I can draw or because I have a camera or do they like me in particular? And I think usually I say no if it's not me in particular they want. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we, we talked about your uni experience and, and I was sort of, I was thinking like, as you were saying, I was thinking like, oh, that's really brave. But I guess because you were getting, like the way you described it is so brilliant, like you're you're getting the jobs that you're learning that about in the future you're already getting. So I suppose you, you kind of had that safety net. Um, but then... To top that all off, you then fucked off the whole of Australia and just went like went traveling. Like, what, <laughs> like so, you were like doubly brave. Firstly, you quit uni and then you just went off traveling. Where where did that decision come from? I mean, I always wanted to travel. I've been raised in a family of travelers, and I'm really lucky in that my parents um, they kind of raised us with this thing that was like seeing the world is your priority, and I always saw success as being able to travel anywhere like I mean I didn't really care about being rich like I don't think I would have chosen art if being rich was the priority (laughs) (laughs) but having flexibility to travel anywhere and having the means to travel anywhere was always like how I saw success um 
Yeah, that is rich. That's like, it was just the obvious choice, like to leave and travel as much as possible. It was looking back a really reckless choice, but I just thought like, fuck it, like whatever, I'll just go for it. Um, but- the worst that happens is that, you know, I have to use my last bit of money to come back crawling back to my parents and <laughs> I was really lucky in that position but I feel like you've done everything in the right order like you've kind of worked out what your values are like what's important to you and then built a life around that because I know something you've said before is be creative with your career and I feel like that's exactly what you've done there you've created a career that fits your fits the life that you want to have yes exactly I think you have to think about what your values are and for some people it's you know And I've met a lot of illustrators and like top level artists who their goal really is to make six figures or to be able to provide for their family or to be able to like they have different priorities. And for me, it was so much about freedom and travel. And that's what guided me. And that's what's still guiding me and what means I say no to a lot of things. And even right now, when I'm in this really transitional period, I have to just keep coming back to those values and remembering why I did this, because um well like I found my success as an illustrator and so a lot of the jobs that I get offered are still in illustration and while I can make lots of money doing that and it's easy it's not where my gut is necessarily leading me to go and I want to explore other things so I've just got to listen to that instinct yeah looking at your stuff it, it seems like there's been a transition and all of a sudden like I found you through TikTok and I just I just found your TikToks like I was just like I had to follow you straight away I was just like that they're unique they're because I've always thought I've always been thinking for Adam because he's a photographer like I've always been thinking the best use of TikTok for him just because it's such a great place to be and when I saw your account I was like this is a photographer that is using this platform really well so there's not even any of your illustration on TikTok so I found you there and then but then when I found your Instagram I was like oh shit you've got this whole like career behind you so what was like it's another brave decision of of, like kind of trans transitioning out of something that you're really well established in and going down a down a new path yeah definitely and it's been scary but starting a TikTok and having this whole other platform where I can explore because I mean I've been doing photography for like 10 years I've always taken photos but I got popular through my illustration and that's just what I've been focusing on the last few years. And, you know, you've got to brand yourself, you've got to make your niche, but eventually that niche becomes a bit suffocating and you're like, okay, um, I want to do other things too. I have other skills and yeah. So TikTok's been a really nice separate platform to Instagram where I can just explore photography and I don't know, like start afresh a little bit. I feel like uh, we quite often talk about on this show, especially because a lot of people are kind of getting started in their journey. They're quite early on and they're often thinking like, oh, I just want to do all of these different things. But how do I pick just one? And I feel like you've gone down the route that we always advise is like picking something and sticking to that for a certain amount of time. And then once you've kind of got a level of establishment in that field, then you can start to branch out. And it seems like that's exactly what you've done. Yeah, I think that's brilliant advice. Um I really stuck with my niche and it's good because I built a platform with that and I built a really good client base. Um, and now it's the point where I'm like, okay, let's listen to that instinct again and, and go in other directions. But I think for any creatives who are a bit further along in their career, no one really talks about how hard it is once you do have a platform to like stay creative. And it's, like sometimes I kind of reminisce the start of my career when I was just doing whatever and I didn't have any pressure on me. Whereas now I'm like, I've got all these followers who expect a certain thing and I've got these clients who expected a certain thing from me. And it's it's really hard to be brave again and, you know, listen to that creative voice that's taking you in another direction. And how do you balance that? I mean, I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> um, I still take on work that is illustration but I'm just excitedly exploring other things now. And I think last year was like barely getting any work as it was because it was that year that we're not going to talk about. Um, (laughs) So I was kind of like, well, when is a better time to start afresh and just do anything that I want? How was it when you've posted like your first piece of photography on your account that you're known 
for for illustration? I mean, obviously it wasn't really well received, but I transitioned into it a little bit kind of sneakily. So I, as an illustrator and like product designer, I created cameras, like these disposable cameras, um, which have my illustrations all over that. So it was like, okay, I've made cameras with my illustrations on them. Um, they're for sale, you can buy them. But then also here are the photos that I took using these cameras. And then so photography started to come a bit more into my creative practice and it was like a, a more organic transition. That's so smart. And how do you, because I imagine when you first start posting those photos, you're not going to get as many likes on them as you would an illustration. How do you kind of battle that? Because I know some people will just be like, oh, fuck, this doesn't work. And then just go back to the illustrations. How important is it to just kind of keep going with what makes you happy rather than what gets likes? Like it just, it, likes don't mean as much as we think they do. And your audience is always going to be behind. Like you're, anytime you try something new, your audience is going to take a while to catch up and like it. But you just have to trust your vision. Because if you keep making your work for your audience, you're just going to be stuck in this rut. Whereas like, yeah, you just, they're just always going to be behind and you just have to trust that they'll catch up and like what you're creating now. Yeah, I suppose it's like when you see a big brand rebrand and then everyone's like, oh, this is awful. I hate this. Or even like when there's a new update on a, an app or something, everyone's like, this is the worst thing ever. And then two weeks later, no one's talking about it and they're just going along with the, with the system. Exactly. Um, for me, a lot of my work was that went viral and that did really well was my like positive af affirmations that I illustrated. So I have all these like quotes from my diary, which are like really uplifting and positive. And they obviously did really well on Instagram because they're shareable, the people want to put them on their story, like they're great, they're easily marketed. So they're going to get more likes. It doesn't mean that that work is better than my other work, but it, mm. it's, it's going to get more likes because of just the nature of it. It felt, I don't know, it just felt a bit weird to be posting positive phrases in a time when no one was really feeling positive yeah. and that wasn't like authentic even though like I knew my audience liked that and I knew that if I posted this it was going to get you know hundreds of shares it was going to get all these likes I just thought like in the long term is this what I want to be doing is this all I want to be creating um yeah. no <laughs> yeah we always we always say that of, of like post what you want to be doing because that's what you're what you're going to get asked for more of um, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because so my account's growing quite quickly at the moment and so there there could be like a month where I pick up like 10,000 followers in that in that month and I sort of look at it and I think you don't you, like none of you guys know me yet so everyone that follows you is on this different level of familiarity with you and your work because it's like I'll write a caption for the day oneers who were following me at 300 followers when when it was nothing and i'll be writing that caption for them because they know me and they know exactly where i'm coming from but then i sort of think i've got all of like every day all of these new people and it and they they don't know me and so then if i take a big risk and post up something different it for the day oneers they're fine but for the new people they're like it frazzles their brain because they're not that's not what they're expecting that's not what they used to well, sometimes it's even the people who've been around for the longest time. I mean, they're, they're like, what are you doing? This isn't why I originally followed you. Like, why aren't you posting positive affirmations anymore? Why are you posting <laughs> photos? <laughs> like... At the end of the day, like it's all a, a game of self-awareness and and understanding what what it, what is that sets you on fire. Because, because I, it would just become so soulless and lifeless to just keep churning the same the same stuff that's when you just become a product and then you become just like this business and some people that's what they want to end up being is a successful business but for me i'm like i'm an artist <laughs> i want to keep creating yeah. and yeah. i want to keep enjoying my work that's the most important thing if i'm not yeah. enjoying it then i may as well have gone into an office job <laughs> yeah i remember hearing something it was like as soon as you start to get bored with whatever you're doing that's about the time you're becoming a brand so it's like an interesting thing it's like actually if you do want that to become a business then as soon as you're bored of it that's probably the time that it's going to become a good business <laughs> yeah that's probably when you're going to be making the money and being successful in that respect i think one thing that i thought was really interesting that you said was um about kind of the gifts that you made because it's like your gifts have got like literally billions of views which is just mental because it's like 
for us, it was like, if something got a million views, that would be ridiculous. But the fact that yours have been used billions of times and been used by all sorts of different celebrities is just kind of crazy that it's out there so much. And one thing I love what you said was the fact that if you want to get hired to make gifts, make gifts, because it's like you just need to start on that route. That's definitely the philosophy I've carried throughout my whole career. It's like you can't expect to be hired for something if you haven't shown the world you can do it. So that's why passion projects and personal projects are so important. All of my major brand collaborations have come off the back of a personal project. So like Snapchat, they hired me to create gifts because I'd already made a whole iMessage sticker app that just for fun one summer because you know that's how I spent my summer was like doing coding and make, designing little stickers but um yeah that's how it is and I'm Adidas hired me for an installation in LA and that's because I made some installations at home I spent another summer like cutting wood and painting things and building stuff in my backyard and Adidas saw it and they liked it so I think yeah if you want to get hired for something you should well, you should already be making it or finding a way to do it yourself. You're listening to Creative Rebels, the podcast for creatives. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider subscribing and sharing this podcast in any way that you can. Yeah, because I feel like that's that's one thing that university doesn't teach you. I feel like university kind of sets you up and we speak to a lot of students who have this mindset of I've done a degree so now people should pay me for the thing that I want to make, which isn't always the case. Like you need to actually go there and make it first and then the people will find you and pay you for it. Exactly. And I think a lot of university degrees have their final year projects, which is when you're meant to explore the thing you really want to do. And those projects are the most important part because that's if you haven't been freelancing or doing anything throughout your degree, that's the one time you do your own project, really see it through and hopefully that's what brands will notice or that that's what like clients will notice um you know fashion students have their final show like this is when you show what you want to do and then you can get hired off of that but if you haven't done that then how are people gonna know you can create something if they can't see it like they do have to see it yeah you got that message recently Ad, didn't you from a from a student who after you gave them a, the advice of just just make stuff for free they were like but I've been told definitely don't make anything for free. Yeah, and I, it just frustrated me. I was like, I was like, okay, just ignore everything your tutors have said to you. If you're going to get paid work, you're going to have to do free work. Free work. It's just it's the way the world works. Like you can't just go out there and because I remember this person was they were in this catch twenty two of like, well, no one's paying me for work, so I can't get more work to be able to show people. And I'm like, well, just do it for free then, like work because you want to do it because you're creative and you just want to create anyway (laughs) like you should just want to create anyway and you should just be doing it because that's what you love to do I mean even me but like now that I'm getting into photography more and like wanting to pursue that professionally which is not something I've really done I'm doing you know a dozen shoots a week just because I want to and it's fun and it's like I'm, you know, an established designer I'm like very successful in illustration I've worked with the biggest brands in the world and yeah, I'm still doing free work because I just want to and I want to explore this other side of creativity. Yeah, people always get amazed when I tell them that I do free shoots all the time, like literally all the time. And they're like, but but what? Like you're you're a professional, like someone who they aspire to be like. And I'm like, but that's just how it is. It's like if there's a week when your only only paid shoots come in and they're not, not ones you've actually wanted to do, then like as a creative, like you need to find the time to actually do the work that you want to be doing because otherwise you get stuck in a cycle of doing work that you don't want to do for money and then all people can see is that so then they ask you for more of that and you go further and further down that down that hole that's right and I I think that's why it's so important that the more successful you get or the more busy you get with paid work the more important it is to have that time to do free personal stuff to make sure you're still developing yourself creatively because if you're just doing paid work 100% of the time, I think it, you you get stuck, like you said, in this cycle of just still doing stuff like that. And then you're like, what's my style again? What do I want to explore? Where's my passion? Yeah. Like, <laughs> How much of your time would you say you spend on kind of personal projects compared to paid ones? I mean, this is a weird year because I'm not getting as much work as I once did. But 
I would say that it's going to be at least 50 50. Um, I always try to make sure I have equal amounts of time on personal projects as paid projects. I mean, it changes. I mean, sometimes I'll have a massive paid project, which takes up all of my time for a couple of weeks. But if I'm not working on that, I'm, I've always got a personal project. Always. Something I'm doing uh, just for fun. Yeah, it's the same with me. And and when your personal projects fund the the work, it's kind of, it's I don't really see it as, so for me, it's street art. And, I, and obviously street art is free and it's out there and anyone can come and view it. But I, I sort of don't, see it as i'm just giving it away for free because at the end of the day it serves as an advertisement for oh you maybe you could buy a canvas for your house or or whatever so it, it's the 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 free stuff is funding the paid stuff anyway so it's sort of this exactly cycle. it's feeding into each other yeah like i never see personal projects as a waste of time or like a waste of money or waste of anything because it's it's going to lead to paid work like it just will in some way whether you realize it or not do you kind of quite like being back at square one? Like, obviously, you're really established. You've got this career. But now it's like you're you're back, like, scraping and clawing from the very start. Yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's very freeing. Um, I think, like, having a big platform um, on Instagram just became... Like, I love it. And it's really great to have this amazing audience who supports what I do. But it also it can be a lot of pressure and so just kind of quietly working away on other things and even just like starting a TikTok and being like you know what this is just going to be about photography and not illustration it's being so freeing and it's reminded me of why I was so creative in the first place and yeah I'm loving it it's good I love I think that's one of the things I love about TikTok is is that you can create their it's almost like a bubble like it's almost like a secure to, I hate to use the phrase but like a safe space it's like <laughs> it is a hundred percent and the audience is completely different there um and now i'm getting a lot of followers off tiktok onto my instagram and they arrive on my instagram and they're like wait what there's all this illustration here <laughs> and so that like it's and i'm getting like questions in my inbox about cameras and it's like the clashing of these two audiences is so funny to me especially because the tiktok audience is so much younger um and has very different it's just a different energy there it's it's interesting i love it i, I just think i think kind like kindness is cool on tiktok and and obviously any social media you're going to get your trolls and stuff like that but for the most part people are in their lanes and they don't really cross over like if you're making feminist content then occasionally you're going to get a troll come over and talk about make america great again or something some bullshit thing on there but like for the most part you're just going to find your people there. And that's that's what I really like about it. Yeah, the algorithm is really brilliant, I think. They've done it really well. I've discovered so many new creators. Um, I think I didn't realize how... I, maybe Instagram's changed, but lately I feel like it's just something about the algorithm isn't working and I, I find it very hard to discover new artists. And I think it's very hard for people to find me as well. Um it's really hard for people to blow up like they used to as a big account. Yeah. Yeah. Like you kind of seem to have to already be established. Whereas TikTok is just like this whole other realm where it's just like, doesn't really matter how many followers you have, you can still go viral and like, yeah, it's great. When you when you moved over to London, so, so moving back from the photography, when you moved over here um, in the beginning, obviously huge move, you're coming from Australia. I'm guessing you didn't know many people here what were your tactics around keeping a roof over your head, getting clients in and surviving? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, for context, I left Australia like two years ago and traveled pretty much full time for like a year, um, maybe two. I can't remember. I was just all over the place. I didn't call Australia home the last two years. And then I kept circling back to London. And that's when I finally made the move to like settle in London um, about a year ago. And yeah, so at that point, um, I was already working with Adobe a lot. So if people don't know, that's like my main client. I partner with them all the time. And my main tactics, my tactics, um, just move there, find an apartment and yeah, get in touch with Adobe here, make sure that any of my existing clients, I try to find the equivalents in the UK and like mm. meet with them. And I did that and that was great. But I think my main 
priority wasn't really so much like set up setting up meetings and meeting all my clients it was more just building on the very few connections I already had um, with creative people rather than brands and companies because I mean that's how I started my creative career in Sydney so I just went about it the same way just meet creatives meet the creatives friends of friends and start to build a network and yeah now I have a really good group of friends and a network is blooming and that's what I think the opportunities come about rather than like I'm going to reach out to this brand. It's more like, I'm just going to talk mm. to this person who's going to mention this who, and then I'm going to work with this person. It's a bit more organic. That's the great thing about the creative community. And I, I just, obviously there's always going to be anomalies, but for the most part, if you reach out to a creative, like they're probably going to be, and if they can't help you, they might know someone who can. And I feel like this community is so much more embracing and there's less of a kind of scarcity mindset of like, actually everything is abundant and we can all eat. So let's all eat together. Mm -hmm. There's room for everybody. And as soon as you start getting weirdly protective of your space and like, oh no, like I can be the only photographer in East London. Like, no, like there's (laughs) plenty of space. There's plenty of jobs. It's a very populated big city. So yeah, I think that so much of the key is just asking, just putting yourself out there and meeting the different people because it's like, I put up a question on my story like yesterday or the day before and um, someone got back to me and was like, oh, one of the biggest problems that I struggle with as a photographer is I want to move into portrait photography, but I can't find anyone to shoot because I've not got any portraits yet. What should I do? So I kind of gave him some advice and then like I put the response up on my, on my story as well. And then someone else got in contact who was like a performer or something and was like, if this guy is based in London, let me know and I'll... I'll I'll happily shoot with this person who had never seen this person's work and it's like just by asking this guy like he was actually based in Cyprus so he wasn't in London at all but if he was then just by saying it and putting it out there to another creative that could have then led to his first portrait shoot so it's like just talk to people just say like if you go through your phone book and just tell everyone this is what you're looking to do someone in there will help you yeah, that's so true. That's so true. I think we forget that people do want to help people and you, I mean, you could be helping them. They might really need a portrait. So <laughs> when uh, you mentioned earlier that you're getting lots of um, DMs, people asking you photography questions, what's the what's the most common question that you're that you're getting? I'm weirdly getting a lot of because I do only film photography. So I'm getting a lot of like very specific technical questions on loading <laughs> film. And I'm like, I don't know what like I put up like one video on how to load your film camera on TikTok and now everyone's like well she must be an expert and I have this very specific model camera from this era that requires this battery what and I'm like (laughs) I can't help you I'm sorry I just don't respond and I'm yeah I'm sorry to those people sitting in my inbox (laughs) but (laughs) let me google that for you for you yeah I mean it's the same thing with being illustrator every day I get questions like what pen do you use or like what application do you use and yeah. I, you like, I'd like to be helpful, but at the same time, I don't want to be an education platform. So I have to kind of put my foot down and be like, I know that I have a certain amount of success, but it doesn't make me an expert. And this is just not what I want to do. I want to create. I don't want to necessarily, necessarily educate. I feel like for younger creatives, often their bigger questions are like, what tools are you using rather than how can I get better at this? Because they instantly think that, oh, if I get these better tools, it will lead to me being a better creative. Like, it, how would you advise someone kind of getting started or like, who's just an artist who wants to improve? How would you recommend people get better at what they're doing? I think a lot of getting better, like getting better skills is just about recognizing your own taste and having better taste. So like consuming a lot of art and looking at it and thinking, why do I like this? Or why don't I like this? And you can apply that to your own work. Like for me, I know that I really like photography. That is, um, you know, I love flash photography, which is such like a taboo, but whatever. I love the use of flash. I love bright colors. I like, um, I like quite like close cropped portraits. Like I've looked at a lot of photography and I'm figuring out what I like. So then it's about how can I achieve that in my own work? So once you have a more confident sense of what you yourself like, I think that's, when you start having a bit more of a stepping stone and 
roadmap to how you can get better. Yeah, 100%. Because I think a lot of people don't do that and they just think, oh, well, what do other people like? And I'm just going to replicate what they do rather than what they actually like. So much about creativity is about your own sense of taste and knowing yourself, which is really hard. But yeah, you have to be pretty strong in your own sense of taste because if you're just doing stuff because other people like it, like you just got to be lost because other people like a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And be brave as well. It's like, it's like I spoke on my episode recently about painting in neon pink and really, I honestly thought no one would, I mean, it does sound stupid, doesn't it? Like all your paintings are going to be neon pink. Like who would like that really? Who would like that? But people, but people do. And it took me a long time to actually get the courage up to, 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 to just go, fuck it. I'm going to paint in neon pink. And it's funny because it, I wouldn't even question, do I like it or not? For me, I'm like, that's what he does. And it looks really cool. He's very confident in it. I, you, people don't even question in it. Like if you're confident in your style, I don't yeah. think other yeah. people... I mean, they might not like it, but it doesn't really matter because you like it. Do you um, develop your own film or do you take it down to Snappy Snaps? And, and what was the decision on, on like, why film camera? I mean, I've always shot on film. Like, I picked up my first film camera when I was, like, 13. So it's just more of a nostalgia thing. And also I like more analog looking photographs. Again, it's down to taste, right? So I know what my taste is. I've always preferred film photos, so I'm gonna take film photos. That's what I'd like. Um, I do know how to develop my own film, but I don't. Um, I just take it down to analog films of Brick Lane. And nice. yeah, and I think it would be nice to do that in the future, but because I'm not really so concerned with the technicals and like the developing of it that process that's not really what I'm like passionate about even though I'll do yeah, it yeah. but yeah no I'm more concerned with taking the photo and capturing a moment <laughs> yeah I 100% get that because it's like so much of it especially as you kind of if you take portraits then it's the interaction that you're having at the time it's like you don't you don't want to be stood in a studio for hours developing something like that's not what makes you happy it's like it's understanding that okay well what part of this creative thing do I like doing and making sure that you're doing more of that rather than the stuff you actually don't want to be doing exactly like what I really love is people and interacting with people which I think is what's led me into photography so I've very quickly realized that's the part it's the interaction with the person um, but I think especially with photography people really get caught up on technicals and that's fine if that's what you're passionate about like I know whole photography accounts dedicated to their gear and what they're using and that's really fun but it's just like not where I'm going um and I think a lot of the like the romance of capturing a moment can be lost in the technicals and the f-stops and numbers mm. that's a that's a really good point and, and when you mentioned gear there I think we sort of touched on it earlier where a lot of a lot of people think let me get the most expensive gear because then I'll be able to do the best thing and and don't take offense to this but like when I look at your cameras, because you show them on TikTok, when I look at your cameras, like they don't look like the most up to date cameras on the market. Absolutely not. <laughs> and I take no offense. I mean, I'm very proudly like one of my photo books I did purely using disposable cameras. Like any Wicked. established photographer is going to be like, what the hell is she doing? But I do believe that like the best camera is the one you have on you and you can create with what you have. And there's something really beautiful about creating with like the most basic of cameras using a home printer scanner and like basic photoshop like i think that's if you're creative then you use what you got i think as well it's like especially with the photography and i say it to people all the time like people have been taking photos for years and it's like people take like i've literally got a book next to me here that's a, a david bailey book from 1962 and it's full of beautiful images and the technology of cameras in 1962 wasn't anywhere near as advanced as it is now yet i've got that book printed out kind of like here with me and it's something that i can take inspiration from like if like if someone if like i'm buying a book that was shot in 1962 if your iphone probably takes better photos than that so it's like you can do that too exactly and i think um Coming from an illustration background and now entering photography, 
I think what really put me off about entering photography for a long time was the fact that people get so caught up in what gear you're using and it it becomes this weird sort of gatekeeping where it's like well if you're not using the best gear then you're not a real photographer and like there's this weird like exclusiveness to it which I think is really annoying because you don't need the best gear and like you said some of the best photographs are taken with technology that is decades old like yeah nowhere near as good as what we might have now I think that's why Instagram's where you've been so successful because it it kind of takes the gear out of it because you don't ever well some people do but pretty much everyone posts a picture and you don't even know what that was taking on taken on it doesn't say on the corner like this was taken with an iphone 12 or this was taken with a sony a7r4 it's like it's just his image do you like it yes or no it is just about the image it doesn't matter what it was shot on as long as you can get the results that you want to get from whatever you have available like it would be interesting to see if you could well actually i've done it before where i've posted pictures that some are with mirrorless cameras and some are with just my phone and actually when it shrank down to like Instagram, you can't tell the difference. Like some of them, like people would be certain that that was taken on a professional camera, but so much of it just comes down to the editing. And I think that's what I like about photography is it's like, as long as you've got a basic tool to take a picture, you can edit it in the style that you want if you can't afford to have stuff that does that. Like if you can't afford a lens that's really sharp, you can use a cheaper thing and then in editing, then tweak it a bit and make it a bit sharper. You can find a way, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I even got caught up in like, oh, I finally saved up and got the more expensive camera and the more expensive lens. And I've taken that camera and my point and shoot camera to a, to a photo shoot. And then I end up liking a lot of the photos taken on my simpler point and shoot camera. But like in my brain, I'm like, but I should like the more expensive, better quality one, right? But you got to trust what you like and you got to trust your taste and sometimes the better photos with the easier equipment i have a friend who's a videographer and he's got a camera called a red which is just this ridiculous like movie grade uh big chunky thing that you like have to carry around on your shoulder is absolutely huge and often he'll go to a shoot and take that because the client feels then reassured because you have this ridiculous 20 grand camera and then he'll shoot everything on a Sony and they'll be perfectly happy with the final result. But it's kind of, you need that gear to, to sort of say to the client, don't worry, you're in safe hands, which is like, it's so bullshit because it should just be the final product. I love that. I love that. It's about appearances. I know I feel yeah. so, I feel very confident professional bringing out my like chunky, huge camera, but like <laughs> in the end, I prefer the other camera, but you know. You show up with what, like one of those Barbie, like, like, from the 1980s like chunky pink cameras or something there's a there's a a youtube channel called digital rev which uh, i've not watched for years actually but they used to do this thing it was like professional photographer with a toy camera and they would give professional photographers like like literally one of them was with a barbie camera so literally a barbie that had like a little camera in it and then there's like little hello kitty cameras and like all these silly toy things and they send out like really like well-known photographers to try and get the best images possible and like it's amazing some of the work that comes back because you're like that is generally a really cool shot yeah it's shot with something you could probably find in a car boot sale for 50p i love that and i think that sends such a good message that it's not about your tools it's about your taste (laughs) could you tell us about the isolation project oh yeah so during my first round of isolation i was back in australia and yeah i really wanted to design disposable cameras for myself i've been using disposable cameras like just at parties for ages and so yeah I designed my own and I sent them to a bunch of different people around the world sent them to like my friends in New York my friends in London you know places that were special to me and I just asked them to document their isolation experience using this camera and yeah the photos that came back were just beautiful and it ended up becoming like a much bigger project where like I made several different versions of the camera and you know, people like signed up to be a part of the project and became this big thing. Is it going to be a book? Well, I hope so. If people send their bloody images to me. (laughs) (laughs) That's the worst, isn't it? Photographers are the absolute worst. I said this on a show recently. Like if you're a creative and the photographer at whatever event that you're at says, don't worry, I'll send you my photos. Get your own photos anyway, because they never bloody do. Yes, (laughs) exactly. I had such good intentions, um, but... 
I've I've got a few photos back, mainly from like the close friends who like they know I'm gonna chase them up. But anyone who I didn't really know personally, my God, send me your photos, please, if you're listening. <laughs> I want to see them. But um, okay. what what was beautiful about these photos is that um, you know the fir- like we were all doing the same thing, staying home, doing nothing. Um, but I created this project because I wanted to to show that even though we're all doing the same thing, which is nothing, it looks different for everyone. Home looks different for everyone. And if you frame it as something that is worth documenting, I think you see the beauty in it. I imagine as well, like the fact that they're disposable cameras. I imagine everyone who takes a picture now will take several different pictures from different angles of the same thing and check which one looks best before they'll go and share it online or share it with whoever. But with this disposable, it's just going to capture exactly what's there and you'll never get to see like those people will never get to see it until they've sent it back to you you've printed it and then showed it back to them exactly exactly there's something really beautiful about having only 24 frames you can't check what it is you just have to capture mm. it as it is and it's quite freeing to just create without being able to double check and yeah a lot of people hadn't even used a camera like that before and it was just like this whole novelty to them and yeah it, it's easy to I, I'm very I'm always an advocate for the disposable camera it's so humble it's so easy and it's um yeah just one of the most like primitive ways of capturing a photo I think the one thing a lot of people have struggled with recently is like work-life balance especially with everything that's been going on working from home and sort of it it gets to the stage where you can't get away from it because you're you're place where you're eating your dinner is also the place where you're working and you're just never leaving um over christmas you actually enforced a a break on yourself didn't you and you were like this is it i'm done for christmas and you you put very clear boundaries in place on your social media so that no one would uh contact you and your commissions are closed etc what was the the decision behind that um uh, yeah i think it was the fact that i was busy with work and personal projects but i needed to allow myself that break um because I just felt like I had to create so I had something to post and that's not really a good reason to create um so it was like start of December to start of Jan- like a whole month I was just like not nah, closing my dms I'm stepping away from this because I, I'm not feeling inspired I have nothing to post and I don't want to just be creating for the pe- sake of posting um mm. And it was really good for me and it's changed my relationship with Instagram and with my online platform where I'm not even posting every day like I used to. And I didn't just like come back to and be like, okay, let's do it exactly like I was doing it before. Like there was something wrong with how I was using the platform. So I came back to it with like a fresh set of eyes and much better boundaries. And how important do you reckon it would be for listeners of the show to take a break for a certain period of time? on social media I think it's just it I think you have to remember that no one really cares <laughs> like for me I was like okay I'm stepping away but like to be honest <laughs> I don't think people care nearly as much as you think they would um I had a moment where this illustrator that I follow she posted and she was like oh so the past six months um I've only been posting on Patreon not Instagram and I was like six months like that's a long time and I looked and it's true. She hadn't been online for six months and I didn't even notice. I literally had no idea. And I still love her work. I'm still following her and I didn't even notice. And that was six months. So yeah, take a break. No one's going to care. <laughs> I'm really glad you said that because I've been beating myself up. I don't have anything to post tonight. And uh, yeah, I've got to be more realistic and just think, yeah, it doesn't really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day. And I think it's better to not post than post something you don't even like. <laughs> Yeah. yeah like that's going to do a lot more damage than disappearing for a while <laughs> what do you think the main thing is that is holding creatives back okay i'm going to speak to creatives in my position um so someone who's like a little bit further on in their career i think the big thing holding us back is that we become known for something and we let that define where our creativity is so like becoming known for something, becoming established for something, some style, some form of creativity, I think that becomes like our own barrier because we become more and more afraid of moving forward. 
So yeah, and even even on a small level, like you post one photo or one artwork, and that's the one that gets the most likes. So you think you should be creating more of that. It might not be the case. This was super inspiring. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really had a blast. Let uh, the listeners know where they can find you online. Okay, so you can find me on Instagram at Martina Martian. So that's M A R T I N A M A R T I A N. Um, you can find me on TikTok, Martina underscore Martian underscore. And if you just want to see my photography and you're not interested in my illustration whatsoever, it's Martina underscore on underscore film. So Martina on film is my purely photography account. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, dude. Thank you so much for having me.